Hello and welcome back to Storytime with your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian. Tonight, we conclude A Nightmare on Elm Street, Protégé. Chapter 23. It'll be alright, sweetheart. He's been gone for hours, Don. He didn't take any supplies to change his bandage. Cheryl's parents don't know where he is, or where she is for that matter, and no one answers the phone in the video store. Becca doesn't pick up either, and both Jerome's and Cheryl's cell phones are evidently turned off. Lynn knew she sounded on the verge of hysteria, but she was too worried about Jerome to care. She sat on the couch in the living room, turned sideways so she could look out the picture window. The curtains were drawn open, giving her an excellent view of a rainy night in an empty street. She didn't want to admit it, but after all the talk about Freddy Krueger last night, she was beginning to fear that something was seriously wrong. Dawn sat in the easy chair next to the couch, legs crossed, cup of tea in hand, the bottom of the cup resting on his knee. He might make out that he was relaxed, but Lynn knew better. He'd brewed the tea an hour ago and hadn't so much as taken a sip of it. He's got the Lexus, Lynn said. So? So aren't you upset that he's kept it out so long? He promised he'd only be gone a half hour or so. What's more, aren't you concerned that he might not be able to handle it in his... She paused as she searched for just the right phrase. Current state? Don shifted uncomfortably in his chair, sloshing tea onto his pants without seeming to notice. What, you mean his burn? Even one-handed, he's a good enough driver. I mean, after last night's accident. She turned away from the window to look at her husband. She loved Dan Starkey, but sometimes she had the sense that he was purposefully being obtuse. I'm not talking about his physical condition. I'm talking about his emotional condition. Maybe Becca was wrong about Freddy Krueger being involved with Jerome's... difficulties. Difficulties? Don nearly shouted the word. He uncrossed his legs, leaned forward, and set his tea down hard on the glass surface of the coffee table. The handle broke off the china cup and it tipped onto its side, spilling tea all over the table. God damn it, Don said in a quieter voice. Tea began dripping over the table edge and down onto the cream-colored carpet. I'll go get a hand towel and mop this mess up. He started to stand, but Lynn said, Forget about it. We can clean it up later. Why don't you come sit next to me? Don hesitated a moment. Maybe I should go check on Brian and Mary. They were in the den playing video games. At least that's where they'd been in the last time either adult had checked on them. And that had been over half an hour ago. They're fine, Lynn said. It's Jerome I'm worried about right now. Don gave her a small smile, nodded, then joined her on the couch. He sat sideways as well, facing her, and they held hands as they looked out the window together. After a few moments, Don said, All right, I'll admit it. I'm starting to get worried too. Lynn squeezed his hand. Of course you are. Now it was her turn to offer encouragement. But like you said, he'll be okay. I hope, she added mentally. And if Jerome's problems really were emotional instead of supernatural, perhaps it would be best if he spent some time at Weston Hills. It would break Don's heart. He'd be convinced that he'd somehow failed his oldest son. But if she could just get him to see that not getting Jerome the help he needed would be the real failure, then maybe. Outside, headlights approached. The car slowed as it neared their driveway, and Lynn saw that it was Alexis. Jerome was home at last. What should we do? Don asked. Should we read him the riot act as soon as he walks in, or should we play it cool and wait to see what, if anything, he has to say for himself? Let's start off playing it cool, Lynn said. We can always yell at him later. She said this with a nervous smile. She was glad Jerome was home, but she was fearful too. It was hard to guess how he would act and how they should, should in turn react to him. Should we move away from the window? Don asked. So we don't look like we're trying to spy on him? Too late. He's bound to have seen us by now, honey. They watched as Jerome turned into the driveway too fast. The rear end of the Lexus went wide and the back tires churned up grass and soil before sliding onto the driveway. He accelerated as he came down the driveway and Lynn's first thought was, that Jerome must really be upset about something to drive this way, but he continued to accelerate and angled the front of the car toward the house. The Lexus leaped off the driveway and careened across the yard, tearing up grass as it went. What the fuck? Don yelled, but it was a question Lynn didn't have the answer to. She didn't know why Jerome was doing it, but she knew what he was doing. He was aiming for the picture window and them. Still holding onto Don's hand, Lynn jumped off the couch and tried to pull her husband after her. 
that he sat frozen, staring at the rain-streaked window as his very own certified pre-owned Lexus coming straight toward him. The car's front wheels hit the edge of the porch, and the front end bounced up. Headlights glare blazed through the windows, and for an instant, it was as if night had suddenly transformed into day. Then the picture window exploded, and the deafening engine roar filled the room. Flying glass sliced into Lynn's face and neck, and she felt Don's hand torn from hers as the Lexus smashed into him and bore him backwards. Lynn was thrown to the side by the impact, and so was spared being crushed as the Lexus's front end shattered the glass coffee table before slamming into the living room floor. The car stalled out and sudden quiet descended, marred only by the ticking of the engine. Lynn tried to stand, but when she put her hands down on the carpet to brace herself, she cried out in pain. Her palms were full of glass shards, and thick red blood welled from the wounds. She could feel more blood running down her cheeks and neck, could see the drops from cuts on her forehead falling past her eyes, and she knew she must have resembled a human pincushion. But she didn't care about the pain, didn't care how seriously she was injured. All she could think about was the mangled, bloody thing that had been crushed beneath the front of the Lexus as it came to a halt. She leaned forward and, using her elbows instead of her hands, crawled awkwardly over to what was left of her husband. He'd been caught between the Lexus and the coffee table, and the impact had reduced most of his torso to crimson jelly. His remains were in two large chunks, head and shoulders, trunk and legs. His arms were still attached, mostly, but they were shattered, floppy things more suited to be the limbs of a rag doll than a human being. Tears mixed with blood as Lynn cried over Don's wide-eyed, open-mouthed face. Red-tinged tears splashed down onto his eyes, but he didn't blink. The driver's side door of the Lexus opened and someone got out, stepping first on the broken ruin of the couch, then to the floor. Lynn didn't look up to see who it was. What did it matter? Don was dead. I told Cheryl that we could make the jump through the window, but she didn't believe me. Can you believe that? The familiar voice tugged at Lynn's traumatized consciousness and she slowly turned and looked upward at a young man wearing clothes soaked with blood. It looked like Jerome, but she knew it wasn't him. You're not my stepson. Her voice was flat, toneless, the voice of a woman who didn't care if she lived or died. I can tell by your eyes. Who are you? Jerome, or rather the thing that had stolen his face, only grinned. Lynn looked toward the Lexus. Given the angle the car now rested at, she could easily see through the windshield. She saw the airbags deflating, saw Cheryl, mouth and wrist bound by duct tape, slump against the glass. At first, Lynn thought the girl was dead, but then she stirred, though she didn't open her eyes. She was alive then, though how badly she might have been hurt from the crash, or from what her captor might have done to her before the crash, was impossible to say. I've got to hand it to you, Lynn. You've got good reflexes, a lot faster than your better half down there. He nodded at Don's corpse, or maybe I should say better halves. <laughs> he started to laugh a horrible, obscene sound that seemed to burrow into Lynn's ears, like a parasite searching for something soft and sweet to feast on. But his laughter ended abruptly when two children came walking slowly into the room, pale-faced and trembling. What was that awful noise, Mommy? Brian asked. It sounded like... His voice trailed off as he took in the scene of death and destruction before him. An explosion, he finished in a whisper. Mary said nothing, but then she didn't have to. Her wide-eyed gaze of shocked disbelief said it all. The monster impersonating her stepson looked upon Lynn's two youngest children with an expression she could only view as lust. You know, Lynn, I think I'll take a few minutes to bond with my siblings before I finish with you. Don't go away now, he turned toward the children. Want to play, kids? I've learned a lot of new games since I saw you last all courtesy of our loving Uncle Freddy, and I'm just dying to show them to you. He started toward Brian and Mary, chuckling softly. Jerome, the real Jerome, could feel the presence of his other self as soon as he approached the house. The streets of Springwood had been deserted, at least here in the dreamscape, so he'd driven the Belasco's Ultimate at top speed, ignoring stop signs and traffic signals. He whipped into the driveway, and sensing a need for urgency, he angled into the yard and drove right up to the door. He threw the car into park and hopped out with the engine still running. As he started toward the door, he experienced a disorienting moment of vertigo. He glanced at the picture window and saw the phantom image of the rear end of his dad's Lexus sticking out. He realized that he was catching a glimpse of the real world, and he understood why he felt such a sense of urgency to get inside. His other self was already there. 
Jerome ran onto the porch and grabbed the doorknob, hoping it would be unlocked here in the dreamscape. But when he gave it a turn, his hope was dashed. It had been a foolish hope. Nothing could be that simple in Freddy's dreamscape. He never tried to kick open a door before, but he'd seen it done plenty of times on TV, and he was extremely motivated. He centered his weight on his left leg, ignoring the pain from the still bleeding bite wound Zombie L had given him, then raised his right foot. He kicked the door, right next to the knob as hard as he could. The door shuddered, and he was rewarded with the sound of splintering wood as the jam cracked, but the lock still held. So Jerome tried again, and then a third time, and finally the door crashed open, the bells hanging from the inside knob ringing wildly. He rushed inside, hurried down the foyer, and found himself in the living room. Like the rest of the Springwood replica here in the dreamscape, the living room was empty, the picture window unbroken, but he could feel the presence of others, could sense pain and fear and the dark anticipation of a hungry predator about to feed. Jerome ran toward the spot where he felt the darkness lay and soon overlapped it. He experienced a fresh wave of vertigo, but this time it was accompanied by a sense of resistance, as if some force were fighting him, trying to push him away. Jerome concentrated all of his will on pushing back, and suddenly the dizziness passed and he found himself looking into the pale, frightened faces of his brother and sister. He'd done it. He'd retaken control of his body once again. That he could feel the presence of his other self nearby, presumably inhabiting the dreamscape at this moment, and he knew he wasn't going to be able to keep this body without a fight. It's okay, kids. It's me. Your real brother. Where's... He turned to look for his dad and Lynn, but he was shocked into silence by what he saw. The Lexus had crashed through the picture window, pinning down and killing his father. Lynn crouched next to him, looking at Jerome and crying. Her face, neck, and hands dotted with fragments of glass embedded in the flesh. No doubt a result of the car smashing through the window. He looked around the room, but he didn't see any sign of Cheryl at first. And then he glanced at the Lexus and saw her collapsed against the car's windshield, eyes closed, and mouth covered by duct tape. He couldn't tell if she was alive or dead, and at this point he couldn't have said which was preferable. Forcing himself not to look at his dad's body and keeping the grief he felt at bay lest it overwhelm him, he turned to Lynn. Don't be afraid. I've got control back for now, at least. Lynn looked hard into his eyes for a moment before letting out a sob of relief. It is you. Thank God. That, that thing took over your body, killed your father, and he was about to... He was about to... Jerome didn't need Lynn to finish her sentence. He had a general idea of what his other self had been about to do to his step-siblings. Are you okay enough to walk? He asked her. I think so, but I can't stand up. My hands... Jerome was too afraid to go help her up himself. He didn't want to get too close to anyone in case his other self chose that moment to attempt to regain control. He turned to his brother and sister. You two go help Mom up. Mary looked confused like she no longer understood English, but Brian nodded. He took Mary's hand and led her over to Lynn. Together they managed to help her get to her feet. Once up, Lynn took a couple experimental steps, then nodded. Great. Take the kids somewhere, anywhere, just so long as it's away from me, and pick some place I'd never guess you'd go. If I can't find you, he won't be able to either. Jerome felt intense rage emanating from his other self like waves of heat radiating off a blazing fire. Hurry! I don't know how much longer I can hold him off. Jerome. Lynn looked at him, so much in her gaze, so many emotions, so many things that she wanted to say, that he wanted to hear, but there was no time. I love you, Mom. Then he smiled at the kids, and I love you two squirts. Now get going and don't stop for anything, please. Lynn hesitated one last moment before nodding. Since Brian and Mary couldn't hold her hands because of the glass shards in them, they held on to her wrists. Together, the three of them headed for the front door. It was too bad the Blasco's car only existed in the dreamscape. If not, they could have used it to get away. One more thing, Jerome called after them. Lynn paused and looked back over her shoulder. If you see me again, if I try to approach you, run like hell. Lynn nodded, eyes filled with sadness. Then she turned and led the children out of the living room. A moment later, Jerome heard the front door open. He kicked in the door of the dreamscape house, not this one, but he didn't hear it close again. They'd made it outside. He was tempted to look out what remained of the picture window to make sure they got away safely, but he didn't want to know which direction they were heading. He couldn't afford to let his other self pick up on that knowledge. You think you're so goddamn smart. 
For the first time since his unsuccessful suicide attempt, Jerome heard his other self's voice in his head. But tell me this, genius. Why didn't you tell them to take your girlfriend with you? Did you forget about her? Or are you secretly hoping I'll take over our body again so you can watch me have some fun with that bitch? Tell you what, bro. You let me back in, and I won't kick you out. We can share our body, and then we can share hers. The offer made Jerome feel sick, but he ignored it. They couldn't take Cheryl, not as long as she's unconscious. Lynn couldn't carry her, not with the way her hands are injured. So what now, Mr. Hero? Now I call the cops. Once they have me in custody, even if you get control of my body back, it won't matter. You'd go to jail for murders you didn't commit. You're an idiot! It's the only way to keep you from hurting anyone else, and to keep Freddy from succeeding and making people remember him again. Prison is a small price to pay for that. Your plan might have worked before I off Daddy Dearest, but his death put me over the top power-wise. You can't keep me out now. The living room shimmered, and everything became wavy and disoriented, as if Jerome were viewing it through water. The room was now both real and unreal, of the waking world and of the dreamscape. He could see the picture window, the couch, the coffee table, all unbroken and the room empty save for him. But he also could see the shattered window, the Lexus, the smashed couch, the broken coffee table, and his father's body, blood and chunks of organs strewn on the carpet around him. He could also see Cheryl in the front seat of the Lexus, pressed against the windshield due to the angle at which the car rested. But in this view, Jerome wasn't alone. Hey bro, nice to finally meet you face to face, huh? It was nearly like looking into a mirror. The other Jerome was the same height and weight as he, and was dressed in the same blood-covered clothes. They had the same hair, same eyes, nose, mouth, and chin. But this second image of Jerome Starkey sported the grin that was more suited to Freddy Krueger, sly, cold, and cruel. Jerome didn't know how this other self had done it, but somehow he'd created an area where both the real and dream worlds overlapped. They stood neither in one nor the other, but somehow in both. Before Jerome could react, his other self slammed a fist into his gut, and Jerome doubled over in pain. Laughing, Jerome's doppelganger kicked him hard in his wounded ankle, and Jerome's leg folded beneath him. He fell to the carpet and lay on his side, clutching his abdomen and moaning. He turned his head and found himself staring into the face of his dead father. I gotta say, I didn't think you'd go down so easy, bro. The other Jerome sounded almost disappointed. But I guess whatever stones you once had came from me. And since we've parted ways, metaphysically speaking, you no longer have the balls to take me. While his double spoke, Jerome felt around the carpet until his fingers closed on a large, jagged shard of glass that had once been part of the coffee table. He gripped it tight, feeling sharp pain as the edges cut into his flesh, but not caring, drawing strength from the pain, and then he rolled onto his feet and lunged toward his other self aiming his improvised weapon directly at his double's unprotected throat. His other self caught hold of Jerome's wrist and stopped the glass shard less than an inch from his carotid artery. Jerome tried to push the shard forward, and the glass sank even deeper into the meat of his hand until he thought he could feel it grind against bone. But his double was too strong, and Jerome couldn't force the shard any further. Blood poured down Jerome's hand and spilled onto his double's. From there, it dripped down to the carpet, causing a crimson stain that slowly grew wider with each new drop. Damn nice try, bro, the double said appreciatively. But you never had a chance. Like I said, I'm too strong now. It's over! The double squeezed Jerome's wrist until the bones began to crack. With a cry of pain, Jerome released the bloody shard and it fell to the carpet. The double gave his wrist a last agonizing squeeze, then shoved Jerome backward. He stumbled but didn't fall, cradling his injured hand to his chest. Jerome gazed at his darker side made flesh, eyes gleaming with hate. I'm going to kill you, you son of a bitch. Cut the bullshit, bro. You're going to stand there and watch as I pull your girlfriend out of the car, carry her outside, and then walk away. And you're not going to follow us. Do you know why? Jerome didn't answer. Because I may not know where Lynn's taking the kids right now, but they have to sleep sometime. And when they do, they won't have any magical dream catchers to protect them. Uncle Freddy will find them. And then he'll tell me where they are. And then I'll pay them a visit anyways. But if you be a good boy and behave, I might just, might forget about tracking them down. It's your call, bro. What'll it be? 
Jerome looked at Cheryl. She was still unconscious, but she was beginning to stir. It wouldn't be long before she came to. Once she was conscious, maybe together, they could... No, it was a stupid idea. His other self had grown too strong, and while Jerome knew the devil couldn't be trusted, he couldn't risk Lynn and the kids' lives, not when he'd only just helped them escape. He looked down at the carpet. It was all the answer his other self needed. Chuckling, the double started toward the Lexus. Chapter 24 Cheryl became aware of cold first, followed by wet, then by the sensation of being carried. She opened her eyes and saw only darkness and feared she was blind. She tried to cry out for someone, anyone, who might help her, but she couldn't open her lips and the sound came out muffled. You're awake! It's about damn time. I've been carrying you ever since we left my brother's house. Jerome's voice, but not Jerome. It's him. The sensation of movement stopped and the world momentarily spun for Cheryl. Her feet came in contact with the hard surface, but something held her ankles together, and she couldn't spread her legs to get her balance. She started to fall, but strong hands caught her roughly by the upper arms and gave her a shake. Snap out of it already. You weren't hurt that bad in the crash, crybaby. Crash? She had a memory flash of him turning the Lexus into Jerome's driveway, angling it into the yard, aiming for the house. She remembered the car hitting the porch and, because he hadn't buckled her in when he put her in the passenger seat, the impact caused her to fly forward. Her wrists, like her feet, were bound by duct tape, so she wasn't able to brace herself. Her forehead slammed into the dashboard, and that's the last thing she recalled until now. She became aware of a shadowy shape standing before her and she realized that, her, that she wasn't blind. It was night, and her eyes were only now adjusting to the darkness. Though she still couldn't make out his features, she knew the person standing in front of her was him, the other personality that had taken control of her, Jerome's body. As to where they were, they were outside, obviously, and had been for a while. It was raining, and her hair and clothes were soaked. Though there were no lights around, she could feel concrete or asphalt beneath her feet. So she was standing on a sidewalk, or maybe the surface of a parking lot. Her head ached, but the pain wasn't too bad. Hopefully he was right, and she hadn't been hurt seriously in the crash. What had happened after she'd blacked out? Had he done anything to Jerome's family? What about Mary and Brian? Had he hurt them? She started to ask, but then quit when she remembered that he'd covered her mouth with duct tape. He gave her another shake, harder this time, and the ache in her head increased to a painful throb, that brought tears to her eyes. Stay with me now. You don't want to miss what's next, honey. He turned her around to face a large dark shape that loomed against the night sky. A bolt of lightning streaked across the heavens, momentarily illuminating the dilapidated abandoned house he had brought her to. Cheryl realized then that she was standing in the driveway of Freddy Krueger's house. She tried to scream, but all that came out through the tape was a terrified mm, 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 sound. The creature that wore Jerome's body laughed. Stand still, and I'll cut the tape around your ankles so you can walk. Don't try anything, though, or I'll just knock you out again. If I'm not careful, I might hit too hard and you'd never wake up again. And I don't much feel like being careful right now. Got me? The lightning flash was long gone, but Cheryl still saw the purple afterimage of the Kruger house glowing on her retinas. She nodded, not knowing if he could see the gesture in the dark. He let go of her arms and she saw him pull an object out of his belt. He knelt down and sawed through the tape wrapped around her ankles. It parted, but he didn't bother removing the pieces of tape from her socks. He stood, then tucked the knife, which she presumed he'd taken from the Starkey household, back beneath his belt. Let's go! Uncle Freddy can't wait to meet you! He took hold of her upper arm once more and escorted her to the front steps. The skin on the back of her neck began to crawl as they mounted the steps and she suddenly found it more difficult to breathe, as if the air were somehow tainted and unclean. A fluttering panic began to rise in her chest, and if he hadn't been forcing her to continue, she'd have turned and fled, for all her instincts were screaming that this was a bad place, a wrong place, a place she shouldn't enter at any cost, because once she was inside she might well never get out again. The feeling only got worse as they stepped onto the porch and walked up to the front door. As he gripped the doorknob and began to turn it, she couldn't help herself. Despite his threats, she couldn't go in there. She pulled out of his grip, turned, and started to flee. But he lashed out with a foot and knocked her own feet out from under her. She fell lopsided to the porch, cracking her right knee and elbow as she hit. 
She let out a cry of pain that was loud even with the tape covering her mouth. Her knee hurt like hell, but her elbow felt as if it were on fucking fire. She was sure she'd broken it. Ha ha ha, dumbass, he muttered. He grabbed her by her injured arm and she cried out behind the tape. Save your screams for Freddy. He pulled her back to the door, opened it, and shoved her over the threshold. She stumbled, but she fought to maintain her balance, not wishing to fall on her broken elbow again. Sharp pain shot through her injured knee, but it continued to support her weight and she managed to remain on her feet. He stepped inside the house and closed the door behind him. He didn't slam the door and it didn't shut with an ominous sound like booming thunder. The door made almost no sound as it closed, as if the air inside the house was too stale and dead to carry sound very far. Cheryl took a breath through her nostrils and almost gagged. A greasy foulness hung in the air, like the lingering scent of a long, desiccated corpse. She couldn't help feeling that the air was tainted somehow, maybe even poisonous. She felt panic rising along with her gorge, and she experienced an overwhelming need to vomit, as if her body were desperate to purge itself of whatever toxins it had just taken into its system. And she fought against the urge. If she threw up with her mouth covered by duct tape, there was a good chance she'd choke to death on her own vomit, and she didn't want to give Jerome's other self, or Freddy fucking Krueger, the satisfaction of seeing her die in such a humiliating fashion. So she choked back hot bile and held her breath until the need to regurgitate had passed. There were no lights in the house. She knew from years of driving past the Kruger house that there were no curtains, and what could be seen of the boarded-up windows was dirty and smeared, as if the foulness of the interior atmosphere had been left a nasty residue on the glass. After she was actually inside, the filthy windows admitted no light whatsoever. Not that there was much outside this rainy night. And the place was dark as a cavern carved deep in the earth. Cold, too. Cheryl shivered, though she doubted the chill she experienced had anything to do with the temperature in here. Uncle Freddy, called the thing that possessed Jerome's body. I'm home and I've brought a friend with me. Nothing happened at first, but then a crimson glow filled the house, making it look like a photographer's dark room. She could determine no source for the reddish illumination. It, it appeared to just be as if it came from everywhere all at once. Well, what do you think? I admit it's a fixer-upper, but with a little work, it'll make a wonderful home. The wooden floor of the foyer was scratched and worn, and the wallpaper was stained and peeling in numerous places. From where they stood, she could see into the front room, chairs with ripped upholstery and stuffing poking out, a couch with a faded floral pattern, cushions missing and springs protruding from the bottom. Chunks of plaster missing from the walls, floorboards warped, twisted, and broken. As she watched, wisps of steam curled up through cracks in the floor, and the air suddenly began to grow hotter, humid, and more oppressive. She remembered something about Freddy then. He'd taken his young victims to a boiler room where he played with them before slaughtering them. He then disposed of their bodies in the boiler's flames. She turned to her captor and gave him a questioning look. In response, he reached out, took hold of the edge of the tape over her mouth and yanked it off with a single swift stroke. Cheryl gasped, as much in relief as in pain from the tape's less than gentle removal. In a rough, hoarse voice, she managed to croak out, Home? Of course. I've got to have somewhere to hang my hat while I go about my work. What better place than this? If anyone hears sounds from the old Kruger place, see strange lights through the dirty windows, so much the better. After all, getting people to remember Uncle Freddy, making him strong again, is what it's all about. The creature that inhabited Jerome's body got down on one knee and took both of her hands in his. I'd be honored if you'd share my new home with me, Cheryl. I mean, take a look at this dump. It sure could use a woman's touch. He laughed then, and the sound seemed to echo all around them, as if the house itself was laughing too. Cheryl just stared at him, too afraid to think of a reply. No answer? He released her hands and rose to his feet. I understand. You need some time to think it over. He grabbed hold of her broken arm and she shrieked as white hot pain shot from shoulder to fingertips. He pulled her toward the couch, then hurled her onto it. Without any cushions to soften her landing, she hit hard. But the sensation was nothing compared to the agony in her arm. She turned around to face him, tears of pain running down her face. But before she could say or do anything more, the spring sticking out of the couch extended outward and wrapped around her, like coiled, metallic serpents, entwining and interlocking until she was held tight to the couch. Comfy? Jerome's darker self asked. 
Meeting your boyfriend's relatives is stressful enough, so I want you to be completely at ease. The wooden floor rippled, changing, shifting, until it resembled a surface composed of cracked, scarred flesh. A large blister formed in the center of the flesh floor, swelling quickly as it filled with discolored serum. The thing chuckled with Jerome's mouth. Welcome to the family, Cheryl. The blister exploded in a shower of black fluid and a grinning form rose upward from beneath the floor. It was Freddy Krueger. After the duct tape had been removed, Cheryl was able to scream, long and loud. Jerome watched the Kruger house from across the street, crouched behind an oak tree in the yard. He'd left the Belasco's car parked at the other end of Elm. He had no idea whether his other self would be able to sense the car in the dreamscape, but he didn't want to take any chances. After his brother had left the Starkey residence carrying Cheryl slung over his shoulder, the real world and the dreamscape had become completely separate again. When Jerome had looked out the front door, he saw no sign of them. What he had seen was the Belasco's car, keys still in the ignition, engine still running. At first, he'd been surprised that his other self hadn't taken the car. But then he remembered, this was the dreamscape, and this version of the Belasco's car existed only here. Bro hadn't taken it because it didn't exist in the real world which meant Jerome could beat his other self to the Kruger house and be waiting for him when he arrived. Jerome had no doubt his dark self would take Cheryl to Kruger's place. He'd sensed it when the two of them had been briefly merged again. Besides, where else would he go? Jerome had hurried to the car, holding his cut hand against his stomach to slow the bleeding. He'd slammed the driver's door shut, put it in gear, and roared across the lawn onto the street, steering with his good hand. He'd driven in the opposite direction of Elm at first not wishing to get too close to the dreamscape location parallel to where his other self was walking, lest he sense what Jerome was up to. Jerome had been forced to take a circuitous route to Elm, but without any traffic to slow him down, he was able to haul serious ass, and he arrived well before his other half and Cheryl. He'd parked and taken up his position behind the tree across the street and waited, cradling his wounded hand and wishing dreamscape rain didn't feel as cold and wet as the real thing. He watched his other self's arrival and witnessed Cheryl's return to consciousness. He was near enough to perceive them, but only as faint, ghostly images. He assumed he'd appear the same to them, and was glad to be well hidden. It was all he could do to restrain himself from running across the street to help her, especially when the son of a bitch knocked her down and she got hurt. But he knew he was only going to get one shot at the bastard who'd stolen his body, and he couldn't afford to waste it. He'd lost his mother to Freddy Krueger before he was born. He wasn't going to lose Cheryl, too. So he waited until they went inside, and a baleful crimson light glowed through the few clean spots on the windows. A tornado had come through Springwood when Jerome was a child, and he still remembered how the air had gone suddenly dead. No sound, no movement. And the light took on an eerie, dark, purplish cast. He experienced a similar sensation now, as if a force of vast power was swiftly approaching and Jerome knew that Freddy Krueger was manifesting within his house, the center of his power in both the physical and dream realms. This was what Jerome had been waiting for. He hoped that Freddy's overwhelming aura of evil would cloak his own presence from the perceptions of his other self, at least long enough for him to do what he needed to be done. He left his hiding place behind the oak tree and started running toward Krueger's house. The ankle where Zombiel had bitten him throbbed as he put his weight on it, and, as if in sympathy, his wounded hand began to hurt afresh. Jerome stopped running and reached down with his good hand to massage his injured ankle. Damn it! He couldn't afford this, not now. He needed to be able to move swiftly if he hoped to. And just like that, the pain in his ankle vanished, as did the pain in his hand. Jerome looked at the palm of his hand. There was still blood on the skin, but the palm itself was smooth and unbroken without so much as a scar to show where the jagged shard of glass had sliced into it. He assumed his ankle was also healed. A thought came to Jerome then, and he smiled grimly. It seemed he had more power here in the dreamscape than he realized. He continued toward Kruger's house, running easily and without pain, ready to confront whatever fate awaited him inside. And that's when Cheryl screamed. Chapter 25 Well, 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 aren't you a pretty one? Kruger's scarred skin seemed to radiate the same crimson as the light that filled the house, and as he spoke, steam wafted from his mouth. He wore his legendary claw glove on his right hand, but the blades were coated with flickering flame. The floor still resembled his scarred flesh, and he stood in the remains of the burst blister. 
His boots covered by black gunk and globs of the foul substance clung to his hat, sweater, and pants. I'd hoped you'd approve, Uncle, Dark Jerome said. Oh, I do. It's been far too long since I had anyone this tasty come to visit me. An old boogeyman like me gets lonely, you know. He roared, mocking laughter. Curls of flame licked past his teeth, and a red-orange glow was visible at the back of his throat, as if he contained a furnace or perhaps a boiler inside himself. This can't be happening, Cheryl said. I'm not asleep. Ordinarily, you'd be right, Freddy said. But here in my house, and with this fine, upstanding young man to create a bridge between worlds for me, it can be happening. And it is! Kruger stepped toward Cheryl, his boots tracking black glop across the scarred flesh floor. Freddy rose and fell silently as he walked, and Cheryl realized the floor was actually breathing. She struggled against the springs that bound her to the couch, but it was no use. They were too tight. Careful, girl, Freddy growled softly. You wouldn't want to hurt yourself. A shimmering ripple passed over the springs, and they became razor wire. Cheryl gasped as sharp blades cut into her skin, and she tried very, very hard not to move. Freddy walked up to the couch while Jerome's other self stood by, watching and grinning. Of everything that had happened to her, that was the worst. Seeing the image of the man she loved looking on in amusement as she was being tormented by Kruger. Freddy leaned his face down close to hers, and she could feel the heat radiating from his ruined flesh. His breath reeked like the phallus sewer in the bottomless pit of hell, and his eyes gleamed with the fire of madness. You have such a lovely complexion, my dear, Freddy said, almost purring. He brought one of his fire-coated claws close to her left cheek and held the tip only an inch away from her flesh. It would be such a shame to ruin it. She couldn't stop herself from trembling. She hissed in pain as razors bit into her flesh and blood began to trickle from her new wounds. Freddy closed his eyes and inhaled, a rapturous expression on his hideous face as if he were a wine connoisseur smelling the bouquet of a particularly fine vintage. Mmm, delicious. His tongue extended, stretching like a long pink snake, and began lapping up her blood, darting between the coils of razor wire without cutting itself. Cheryl bit her lip to keep from screaming again, afraid that she'd only injure herself further by moving. She turned to look at the other Jerome, hoping to draw at least a bit of comfort from seeing his body, if not his soul. But something strange was happening. The other Jerome's eyes went wide and his entire body stiffened. His arms and legs began to jerk as if his nervous system was short-circuiting. His facial features contorted, and for a brief instant, his face actually seemed to go blank. Nothing but smooth, featureless skin, and when it returned to normal, she knew the being looking at her from behind those eyes was her, Jerome. Hey, Freddy, Jerome called. Kruger's tongue flew back into his mouth, and he turned to scowl at Jerome. What do you want, kid? Don't you know it's not good manners to bother your Uncle Freddy when he's very busy? I thought you might like to play a quick game of tag, Jerome said. You're it. The carving knife his other self had taken from the Starkey home was still sheathed behind his belt. Jerome drew the knife and started running toward Freddy, blade raised high, ready to strike. But just as Jerome reached the undead madman, Freddy lunged forward and buried his flaming claws in Jerome's abdomen. Jerome cried out in pain and dropped the knife. Blood bubbled past his lips and he looked at Freddy, a lost, confused expression on his face. F father he whispered. Freddy stared at the young man he'd just skewered, and a look of horrified realization came into his eyes. No! he shouted. Jerome's body slid off the claw knives and slumped to the flesh floor. It lay there, eyes wide and unblinking, arms and legs still. Kruger's blade no longer burned. Their flames had been snuffed out in Jerome's guts. Guess who jumped out at the last second, bitch? Cheryl knew that voice. She looked toward it, and at first she didn't see anything. But slowly, Jerome's form appeared, standing only a few feet away from Kruger. His clothes were no longer bloody from his other self's rampage of terror, and he showed no sign of having been injured by Freddy's claws. You fool! Freddy snarled. You just sacrificed your own body! To stop me! Jerome smiled. What can I say? It seemed like a good idea at the time. Damn you! Freddy roared and the entire house shook as if in the throes of a violent earthquake. 
I'll torture your spirit until the end of fucking time for this. I'll do things to you that Satan himself couldn't stand to watch. He paused and then turned to look at Cheryl, and his cracked, scarred lips stretched into a sly smile. And as an appetizer, how about we start off with a little sliced hottie? Kruger gestured with his claws, and Cheryl screamed as the razor wire that held her began to slowly tighten. Jerome ran forward and grabbed Kruger's claw hand by the wrist. He forced it upward, and the razor wire stopped contracting. With his other hand, Jerome grabbed Kruger by the throat and squeezed as hard as he could. Soft, wet choking sounds came out of Kruger's mouth, and his eyes were wide with fear. I've discovered something since the last time we saw each other. You did too good a job when you injected some of your darkness into me. Maintaining his grip on Kruger's throat, Jerome began to slowly force him backward, step by step. You not only passed some of your evil onto me, evil that became a second personality, you also gave me power over the dreamscape. I can sense what the black shit is where you came out on the floor. Becca told us about it. It's all the negative energy that dreamers purge during nightmares, isn't it? Fear, hatred, despair, loneliness, envy, selfishness, and all the other dark emotions all gathered beneath your house like a basement where a septic tank's backed up. Jerome was forcing Kruger toward the broken blister where a pool of viscous ebon filth bubbled and oozed. Cheryl thought she could feel what Jerome was talking about, since the accumulated awfulness of all those negative emotions, like psychic toxic waste lying beneath the house. Jerome continued, It's the source of your power, Becca said, but power is just a tool. It can be used by anyone, as long as they know how. Jerome had pushed Kruger to the edge of the blister pool, and the black gunk bubbled upward, becoming thicker, more solid, lengthening until it had formed a large ebon tentacle. The black limb wrapped around Freddy's midsection just as Jerome released his hold on the undead maniac. The tentacle pulled Kruger down into the black pool and he frantically slashed at it with his claws. But the gunk just oozed back together after every cut. As Freddy continued to sink, he stopped fighting and fixed Jerome with an angry glare. This isn't gonna stop me, you know. I'll be back. I always come back. Kruger laughed as the black goo rose past his neck, up and over his chin finally covering his mouth and silencing him. His eyes continued to blaze with fury until they too sank below the ebon surface and Freddy Krueger was gone. Jerome stared at the bubbling black pool for a few moments, as if waiting for Krueger to suddenly reappear and attack. But the pool, as well as the scar tissue floor, began to fade, becoming once more only cracked and warped wood. It was over, if not for good, at least for the meantime. Jerome turned to Cheryl and gestured, the razor wire became simple springs again, and they fell away from her and retracted into the couch. But she was bleeding from dozens of cuts. But she didn't think any of them were serious. She stood, ignoring the pain in her broken arm and her sprained knee, and went to Jerome as quickly as she could manage. He held up his hands to stop her before she got too close. You can't touch me. He nodded toward his body, lying motionless on the floor several feet away. That's all that remains of my physical form. I'm... I'm just a dream now, he smiled sadly, and a fading dream at that. Tears rolled down Cheryl's cheeks, but these weren't tears of pain or terror. These were tears of love and sorrow. I just wish, I know, me too. I'd heal you if I could, but you're real and the two worlds are drifting apart. I'm afraid you'll just have to get better the old-fashioned way. She smiled. I'll manage. She was beginning to have difficulty seeing him. The crimson glow that lit the Kruger house was growing dim, and Jerome's form was becoming blurry and indistinct. As if her eyes could no longer keep him in focus, she understood that he belonged to the dreamscape now, and as the two realms pulled apart, so were the two of them being separated. Will I... will we ever see each other again? She asked, afraid of what his answer would be. Jerome smiled and shrugged. Anything's possible in your dreams. I love you, Cheryl. I love you, too. And then he was gone, and darkness filled the Kruger house once more. All was silent, save for the sound of a young woman crying softly. Chapter 26 Epilogue It continued raining for almost a week after that night, but on the morning of Jerome's funeral the clouds finally retreated and the sun returned. There had been a lot of funerals in Springwood recently. The Three Pusketeers, Mr. Hauser, Mr. Nilsson, 
Miss LeClaire, Mr. and Mrs. Velasco, L., Mr. Starkey, and Becca. And so Lynn had held off on Jerome's for several days longer than she might have otherwise, out of respect for the other families, if nothing else. Cheryl appreciated the extra time. Her broken elbow had required orthopedic surgery, and she was only now filling up to the ceremony. Her elbow had pins and wires inside holding the shattered bones together, and she wore both a cast and a sling. At least her knee hadn't needed surgery, and none of her cuts needed more than a few stitches. Here and there. She'd gotten off lucky, a lot luckier than so many others, Jerome included. The only ones present at the graveside that morning were Lynn, Brian, Mary, Cheryl, and a rent minister Lynn had been forced to bring in from the nearby town of Ash Creek. All of Springwood's clergy, sympathetic toward Lynn's situation as they might be, had refused to conduct her stepson's funeral service. Jerome's coffin was already in the ground. There'd been no viewing at the funeral parlor, and the rent minister mumbled a few insincere words over Jerome's grave. Then, check already in pocket, he got the hell out of there as fast as he could. The four mourners stood silently for a time, looking at the mound of earth beneath which Jerome was now buried. There was no headstone yet. All the better, Cheryl thought, as it would make locating Jerome's resting place more difficult for both vandals and the morbidly curious. After a time, Lynn said, Thanks for coming, Cheryl. My parents didn't want me to. I told them if they ever wanted me to speak to them again, they should shut the hell up and get out of my way. Lynn smiled. Guess they did, huh? Yep. They fell silent again for several moments. A gentle breeze blew through the cemetery, setting the trees to rustling. Birds sang, oblivious to the grief of four humans standing beside a mound of dirt. It's pretty here, Mommy, Mary said. I think Jerome would like it. Lynn smiled down at her daughter and lay a hand on her head. I'm sure he does, honey. Mary moved closer to Lynn and hugged her waist. On the other side of their mother, Brian edged closer as well, and Lynn put a hand on his shoulder. It's not fair, he said. Everybody thinks Jerome killed all those people, that he killed Daddy, but it's not true. Lynn gave her son's shoulder a reassuring squeeze. You're right, it isn't fair. Jerome saved the four of us, and he'd have saved the others if he could have. He gave his life to stop the bad man who really was responsible for all those deaths. No matter what anyone else says or thinks, your brother was a hero. Don't you ever forget that. Brian didn't reply, and Cheryl wondered if the boy would ever fully understand what had happened. Hell, she wondered if she ever would. The official version of events was that Jerome, a teenage boy with a known history of anger management issues, as the media put it, had snapped and gone on a murderous rampage. A rampage that ended gruesomely enough in the house of a dead serial killer when his girlfriend was forced to stab him to death to save her own life. This, despite the fact that the knife she supposedly used to kill him had neither her fingerprints nor his blood on it. Lynn and Cheryl had told the truth to the police, and Cheryl was certain the cops believed them. After all, this was Springwood. But she also knew they couldn't afford to allow any talk of Freddy Krueger to start up again, and so they'd fed the media a story that was safer, even if it wasn't true. What now? Lynn asked her. Cheryl didn't need the woman to clarify. She knew what she meant. How are you going to go on from here? I'll graduate soon, and then I'll go away to college somewhere far, far away, and never come back. What about you, Lynn? I have a cousin in Maryland who's divorced and doesn't have any kids. She's invited us to come live with her for a while. I, I don't think we'll be coming back to Springwood either. Cheryl didn't blame Lynn. The memories the town would hold for her kids and herself would be bad enough. But as long as they stayed in Springwood, Brian and Mary would always be the siblings of the crazy kid who'd murdered 11 people. That was no way for children who'd already experienced so much trauma in their young lives to have to grow up. Would you write me when you get settled in Maryland? Cheryl asked, just to let me know how you're doing. Of course, dear. But Cheryl could tell by the look in Lynn's eyes that she didn't really mean it. Lynn gave her a hug then, careful of Cheryl's arm. After she pulled away, Lynn looked at Jerome's grave one last time. I really did love him, and I tried my best to be a good mother to him. In the end, I hope he knew that. I'm sure he did, Miss Starkey. And she was. Lynn gave her a grateful smile, and then she led the kids away from their brother's grave. Cheryl watched them walk between the gravestones. There were so many here in Springwood. And up a gently sloping hill to their car, Lynn got the kids in, then gave Cheryl a last wave before climbing behind the wheel and driving off. Cheryl turned back to Jerome's grave. 
She knelt and pressed the tips of her fingers into the freshly turned earth, as if by doing so she might somehow connect to Jerome's spirit. I miss you, she said softly. She didn't expect a reply, of course, but she paused a moment anyway, just in case. It's been pretty crazy since you left. Reporters from all over the country are in town. Hourly updates on all the news shows. TV producers calling me for interviews. One guy even wanted to pay me for the rights to make a movie of my harrowing tale of survival, as he put it. She laughed and shook her head. It's nuts. She grew more serious then. They're talking about him again. Kruger, I mean. Every reporter is rehashing the story of the Springwood Slasher and all the children he killed and how he was finally burned to death by the vengeful parents of his victims. As I walked out of my house to come here today, I saw a couple neighbor girls jumping rope on the sidewalk. They were chanting a nursery rhyme, and even though I hadn't heard it since I was a little kid, I'd forgotten all about it, actually. I remembered every word as soon as I heard those girls chanting. She took in a deep breath and let it out as a long sigh. He won, didn't he? The only answer she received was a sudden gust of wind that blew through the cemetery, carrying with it the sound of dark laughter. <laughs> the end. Wow. I gotta say, I really enjoyed this book. I'd love to hear everybody else's feedback, what you thought of the book. Of course, Freddy had to have an open-ended ending. I mean, look at the very first movie, the very first Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Nancy thought she had him beat, and then Freddy pulls her mom through the mirror at the end, and the kids get trapped in the, you know, the green and red striped car. So, I mean, the ending, you know, yeah, Freddy's laughter, it ends on that, and he won and all that. But, I gotta say, out of all the books I've read so far on this channel, this one has kept me the most entertained. I really enjoyed it. It felt a lot like what they would do in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. So I'd really like to hear what you guys thought of it, so please drop some comments and let me know. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe, click the like button, click the bell so you always know when new chapters are dropping. I really appreciate you guys sticking around and listening to this book. I hope you enjoyed it. After the video's over, if you want to hear, I'm throwing in a couple little outtakes from tonight's recordings. You might laugh, I don't know, but there they are. Tomorrow, I'll begin reading some more, because I gave you all the sneak peek the other day of the prologue from it, and tomorrow, I'll officially begin narrating A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Dealers. It's a really good book. I think you're going to enjoy it. So until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening and pleasant dreams! I hope, she added mentally, and if Jerome's problems really were emotional instead of supernatural, perhaps it would be best if he spent some time at Weston Hills. Fucking truck. Tears mixed with blood as Lynn cried over Dan's... Wow, it actually says Dan. His name is Don. That's a typo.